In this online lecture, we're going to take our aromaticity skills here and apply them to sample problems so that we can do this quickly on an exam. And basically, all we're trying to do here is evaluate if a molecule is aromatic or not. And what I want to show you here is the thought process, and I also want to show you situations you might find yourself in and how to handle them. So let's start with this example right here. Is this following molecule aromatic? Well, remember, we should think of our two criteria here, which we learned in the previous online lecture. First, notice we got a pi bond right here. So in your head, you should be thinking the only thing that would make sense of this pi bond is if there were two p orbitals sideways overlapping. And look at the rest of the molecule. That would have to be true for these two carbons right here. It would have to be true here. This would have to be true about this double bond. And this double bond would be this. Notice what we have here is the uninterrupted pi cloud. Later on, I'll show an example where the pi cloud is interrupted. But for this, we can see you can completely connect all of these pi electrons. So the first criterion is met. Now, what about the second one here? Well, let's see how many pairs of pi electrons this molecule has. Here's one pair right here. We got this two, three right here, four, and then five. There it is. We have five pairs of pi electrons. That is an odd number of pi electrons, so the second criterion is met, which means this molecule is aromatic. But remember, we also have that alternative second criterion here. Let's see how it would apply here. Notice if you were to count all your pi electrons, you would get a total of 10 pi electrons. And remember, we saw in the previous online lecture, the 4n plus 2 formula does land on 10. So this molecule meets the second alternative criterion, having that 10 pi electrons here. So definitely, this molecule is aromatic. Now, you might want to decide which method you want to use for criterion 2, the regular one or the alternative one. For the rest of these examples, I'm going to be using the regular one. But feel free to pause the video and check if the second alternative one works for the remaining examples. So let's look at this second example here. This is called a heterocyclic compound. It's heterocyclic because it has an atom other than carbon in the ring. This nitrogen would be the hetero atom. Let's see if he's aromatic. Well, again, let's focus on the pi bonds here first. Remember, in our head, this would make sense of this pi bond right here. The pi bond on the left would have to have these two p orbitals sideways overlapping. But what about this pi bond right here? Well, remember, by definition, if it is a pi bond, you have to have two p orbitals sideways overlapping, which means this orbital on the nitrogen has one electron in it. Is this possible? Let's make sure. Let's get a close-up view of that nitrogen. Notice he's doubly bonded to the carbon on the right, and he's singly bonded to the carbon on the left. Here is our close-up. Let's try to make sense of his bonding by looking at the orbitals that surround that nitrogen. Remember, if you were to evaluate him, you would see that he is sp2 hybridized, which means he has one sp2 orbital like this, creating that sigma bond to the upper left carbon. He has a second sp2 hybridized orbital, making the sigma bond to the carbon to the upper right. And he has his third sp2 hybridized orbital. But remember, he also has an unhybridized p orbital. Now, also remember, typical of nitrogen, he has a lone pair of electrons on him. But those lone pair electrons would have to be in the sp2 orbital. And why is that? Because remember, there has to be one electron in the p orbital in order to make the pi bond to the carbon in the upper right. So here is that carbon right here with his p orbital, and there is our sideways overlapping. So this must be the orbital arrangement of nitrogen. And what I want to show you here is that notice everything fits. Everything has a home. The lone pair electrons are sitting in one of the sp2 orbitals. The other sp2 orbitals are making bonds, sigma bonds that is, and the remaining electron in the p orbital is making the pi bond. So notice here, careful, what would you count as a pi electron? You wouldn't count these, right? Remember, these are electrons in an sp2 orbital. 
But however, this electron right here is in a p orbital, so we would count him as the pi electron. So let's go back to our structure here. Now that we got a better look at that nitrogen, we can clearly see that we have that uninterrupted cloud of pi electrons. So the first criterion is met. Now, what about the second one here? Well, this would be one pair of pi electrons. This would be another pair right here, and we would have this pair right here. So this molecule simply has three pairs of pi electrons. Notice, that's why it was important for us to really get a good look at that nitrogen, because we wouldn't want to count those lone pairs, the electrons below him, as pi electrons. So that means the second criterion is met. This molecule is definitely aromatic. Let's look at another example here. Look at this molecule. Notice it's not neutral. It has a carbocation there at the top. Could molecules like this be aromatic? Well, let's see. Here are criteria one and two. And of course, let's investigate the first criterion. But let's start right here at this carbon at the top. If you filled in the hydrogen here that has to be here and determine his hybridization, you would see that he is sp2 hybridized, which means he definitely has an unhybridized p orbital here. And in this case, that's where the positive charge resides. We simply need to look at this as a carbocation has not only a positive charge, but the positive charge rests in an empty p orbital. So let's look at the remaining carbons here. Again, the double bond on the right here has to have two p orbitals sideways overlapping. The double bond on the bottom has to have this arrangement, and the other double bond has to look like this. What we're learning here is that this molecule does have an uninterrupted pi cloud. I'm going to prove this to you in a second, but we need to make sure we know that that's possible. So the first criterion is met. Now, what about the second one here? Let's count the number of pairs of pi electrons here. There'd be one right here, two, and we got three over here. That is three pairs. It's an odd number. The second criterion is met. So this molecule is definitely aromatic. So notice you don't even have to be neutral to be an aromatic compound. You could be a charged species, or in this case, you could be an intermediate. However, let's make sure we understand that we do have an uninterrupted pi cloud here. Let's go back to our orbital view of this molecule, which looks like this here. And remember, because this is a p orbital here, the fact that he doesn't have an electron doesn't interrupt the pi cloud. The reason why is because notice this electron right here could move via resonance. And what you would get is something like this, a complete rotation. He would move to the next p orbital, and so would all the others, and that means the pi bonds would also shift as well. You would then end up with this structure right here. Notice this move can keep going. We could make another rotation just like it that looks like this, and this would be the result. Notice what I'm showing you here is that the pi electrons can actually circulate around this ring. This is why we can think of this as an uninterrupted pi electron cloud. However, look at this example. Notice this carbon right here, if you were to determine his hybridization, you would get sb3 hybridized. And let's do this. Let's explain his bonding. Remember, every sb3 hybridized carbon has four sb3 hybridized orbitals. One of them would make this bond right here. Another one would make this bond. And another one, the last two, would make these two bonds within the ring. Notice that means this carbon doesn't have an unhybridized p orbital. And notice what this does to all the other carbons in this ring that are sp2 hybridized and have an electron in an unhybridized p orbital. This top carbon in this molecule prevents the electrons from circulating around the ring. This electron right here simply can't move to an empty p orbital because there's no p orbital there to accept him. So this molecule on the right has an interrupted pi electron cloud, which is why this molecule is non-aromatic. So let's look at another example here. Is the following molecule aromatic? Well, let's run it through the criteria. And let's first focus on this carbon right here. Filling him in, he happens to have a hydrogen. 
And if you were to determine his hybridization as it is right here in front of you, you would actually get sp3 hybridized. Which means at first glance, it may be that this carbon doesn't have an unhybridized p orbital. But however, remember, this is not the only version of this molecule. Remember, we talked before in another online lecture about resonance. This structure has some resonance. We can say that these lone pair electrons move this way, and these pi electrons right here jump up out of the way on top of this carbon. What you end up with is this resonance structure. Notice what happened during this resonance. This carbon right here turned into this carbon right here. If you were to evaluate the carbon right here that the arrow is pointing to in terms of hybridization, now you would get that he's sp2 hybridized. So the question is, is that carbon sp3 or is it sp2 hybridized? Well, remember how resonance works. It's both, actually. Or we say that carbon has both sp3 and sp2 character. So here's what we're learning. Let's go back to our structure. Because there is a resonance structure here that makes that top carbon sp2 hybridized, we're allowed to consider him as an sp2 hybridized carbon which means these electrons right here, we could possibly stick them in a p orbital. Remember, again, if we're saying he's sp2 hybridized, he definitely then therefore has an unhybridized p orbital. And remember, electrons have to live in orbitals, so it's possible for us to place that lone pair of electrons in this p orbital. So let's finish him off here. The two pi bonds in this molecule could only be explained by p orbitals having this arrangement. Which means that we have meet the first criterion, we have an uninterrupted pi electron cloud. But notice, in the second criterion here, counting the pairs here, we would get one, two, and notice we can call this three. So this molecule has three odd pairs of pi electrons. Which means the second criterion will be met which means this molecule will be aromatic. So notice there was an incentive for those lone pair electrons on the top carbon to be in a p orbital, because if they weren't, the molecule wouldn't have been aromatic. And remember, aromatic molecules have superstability. So if a molecule could arrange itself in a way that in the process makes him aromatic, he will do that. This is what we're learning through this sample problem. And this is why we have to see many examples to really get this down. So let's look at another one then. Is the following molecule aromatic? Watch what happens here. Let's test our two criteria. Looking at our molecule, the pi bond on the right would have to have this arrangement. The pi bond on the left would have to have this arrangement. And let's look at this nitrogen right here. If you did a quick little evaluation of his hybridization, you would actually see that he's sp3 hybridized. But remember we learned from the last example that he might have resonance, and let's look at the resonance here. We can say that these electrons jump down here, these electrons on the pi bond jump up onto this carbon, we end up with this result. Notice if you evaluate this nitrogen now in this case, you would actually see that he is sp2 hybridized. So again, remember, this means that we can consider that nitrogen as sp2 hybridized. If you couldn't draw this resonance, then we couldn't consider the nitrogen sp2 hybridized. So let's go back to our molecule here. If we're going to consider him sp2 hybridized, where are we going to put then his bonds and his electrons? How would they be arranged? In what orbitals? Well, let's do the same thing we did with the previous example. Let's get a closer look. If this nitrogen right here is sp2 hybridized, remember it means he has three sp2 orbitals. One here making this bond, one here making this other bond, and one directly below making the bond to the hydrogen. Which means he also has his unhybridized p orbital. It follows then that the lone pair electrons, they have no other place but to reside in that p orbital. Which means we're going to be counting them as pi electrons. So let's go back to our example here. We've just proved that these lone pair electrons right here are residing in an unhybridized p orbital. What that means then is that this molecule has his uninterrupted pi cloud. So the first criterion is met. Now let's check the second one here. 
This right here would be one pair. This would be the second. And notice we got a third pair right here. So the second criterion is met. And this molecule is now aromatic. Notice what you're learning here is that's what you're allowed to do to try to determine if a molecule is aromatic. I'm merely showing you how to think through these molecules. And in the process, showing you what you're allowed to do. This is how we will master this concept. So let's look at another example. This whole time we've been getting aromatic molecules, but let's look at a case where you wouldn't get one. Let's say, for instance, we're asked to evaluate if cyclohexane is aromatic. Well, remember the two criteria here, if you were to run it through, you would first notice that every carbon in the ring is sp3 hybridized. If that's the case, none of these carbons have unhybridized p orbitals, so there's definitely no pi electron cloud. And if there's no pi electrons, there's no odd pairs of pi electrons. So this molecule would be considered non-aromatic. One quick little thing here that I'd like to also discuss is some of the nomenclature concerning these aromatic molecules. For instance, the molecule on the left is called cyclobutadiene. We'll see later on that he's actually anti-aromatic. But another name for him is 4-anuline. Where is this nomenclature coming from? Well, annual kind of comes from the word annual, like annual every year, or ring, or cyclic. And then the E-N-E -E ending means, of course, alkenes, double bonds. And the 4 is the number of atoms in the ring. So we read 4-annuline as a 4-membered ring with alternating double-single double bonds. We should be aware of this nomenclature because it's sometimes used on an orgo test. So for instance, the molecule on the right we know is benzene, but using this alternative nomenclature, you could also call him 6-annuline. Again, he has 6 carbons in his ring. And to just make sure you got this right here, notice this molecule has alternating double single double bonds. It's a ring. If you count all the carbons, you're going to get eight carbons. So you can call him cyclooctatriene, or you can call him 8-annuline. Well, this concludes this online lecture, but you should be able to find another one with even additional sample problems. Please make sure you watch that as well.